Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. My name is Alex Kearns and I am CircleUp's Community Manager. For those of you less familiar, CircleUp harnesses the power of machine learning to provide capital and resources to emerging consumer brands. We currently provide working capital loans and growth capital equity investments through internally managed funds. With Helio, our proprietary machine learning platform, we've built the world's largest and most robust repository of early stage CPG and retail intelligence. And we take a quantitative approach to investing to support promising entrepreneurs like many of you here today. I'm thrilled to partner with Retina to bring you today's hosts, Michael Greenberg and Professor Daniel McCarthy, two leading experts in the field of lifetime customer value. With that, I'll go ahead and hand things over to Michael and, D and Professor McCarthy to share a little bit more about themselves, and then we'll go ahead and dive into the presentation. Great. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate it. Um, so it's, it's a real pleasure to be here with everyone, and uh, hopefully this will stir up a lot of uh, robust questions at the end. I can say as a uh, you know fellow serial entrepreneur that I and very sensitive to uh, everyone's plight in the emerging brand world, and hopefully the value that we add today with some of this conversation will uh, will help you on that journey. And more importantly, I'm really excited to be joined by uh, Professor McCarthy, who really is a luminary in this field and has helped move it forward quite a bit. Um, Professor McCarthy, would you like to talk a little bit about your uh, your work right now? Yeah, it sounds great. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, it's really great to be with you. And like Michael, I am also a serial entrepreneur in addition to being a ivory tower academic. So uh, I got my PhD in statistics at the Wharton School, uh, but I very quickly made a pivot into marketing with uh, Professor Peter Fader, who's uh, one of the uh, kind of premier quantitative marketing professors uh, at the Wharton School, uh, specifically focusing on customer lifetime value. And it was in, I believe, the third year of the PhD that we started our first venture together, uh, which was basically, you guessed it, a CLV company. We basically, for companies very large and some uh, that were very early stage, like uh, you know, perhaps some of the uh, companies in the audience today, uh, we would predict what customers will do in the future and use that to help those companies make uh, better tactical marketing uh, decisions, whether it be for customer acquisition or for customer retention. Um, my dissertation is about customer-based corporate valuation, which I believe to be the kind of financial embodiment of customer centricity. And it really is kind of the engine that powers uh, CLV and what it implies, how it translates into the overall valuation of companies. I'd sold uh, Zodiac to Nike in March of this year. Uh, they're making a big pivot into better understanding uh, their customers and establishing direct relationships with them. And just the following month, I started a, a separate company that's all about uh, specifically customer-based corporate valuation, which is, again, CLV, uh, but rolling everything up to the level of what it implies for the value firms. So hopefully today I should be able to... Uh, you know, provide some perspective both uh, from a theory uh, from the theory side of things but then also you know kind of from your side you know how, how we can bring this in action actually you know make it useful for uh, for your companies great well thank you professor and I'm going to go ahead and uh, get ready to uh, present there's always the moment of truth so. okay um, so as uh, Professor McCarthy stated, you know, what we're going to go into is uh, first a very strategic high-level discussion. And we really wanna hit these three points. So the major takeaways are first, obviously, how do you really calculate customer lifetime value? There's you know, simplistic approaches, and then as your company collects more data and you become a little bit more mature, you can really get a, a much more targeted approach, which then unlocks a lot more value for the business. Um, the second uh, section is going to be, as Professor McCarthy alluded to, really what happens when you don't make CLV uh, at the heart of everything that you're doing, decisions in the company. So he's going to give you sort of uh, these twin case studies that talk about when one business gets it right and one gets it wrong, what are sort of the implications here. And then finally, we'll get into the area which I think for the emerging brands you'll find very valuable, and that's sort of the tactical approach. How can you then, once you have uh, CLV, really leverage it uh, tactically throughout the business to increase customer lifetime value, 
uh, but also in other ways, you know, really start projecting out the future of your business. So the first thing is, you know, why why is this the time of CLP? And for those who religiously read the Mary Mika report when it comes out, there was a whole section actually dedicated to it in her last report. And I think the major reason for this is it's no longer enough to just acquire customers because the cost of acquisition is just going through the roof. It's really stratospheric. And for those of you uh, listening that happen to be acquiring, uh, especially through digital channels that used to be much more easy or organic from an acquisition standpoint, we're all seeing this pain. In fact, my co-founder at Retina uh, was an executive inside of Facebook and also inside of PayPal. And they were really trying to obviously fight this problem internally as well because they want to make their own platform more relevant to advertisers. But nonetheless, with more dollars flowing into these platforms, we're seeing a radical increase in the cost of acquisition. So therefore, we must know that the customers that we're acquiring are right side up, that the unit economics are making sense. And again, Professor McCarthy will get into unpacking that a little bit more. And when we're talking about customer lifetime value, there's really sort of two ways to be thinking about it. There's the historic approach, which is, you know, how you get started. This is probably what most businesses, even in day one, should be starting to think about. And then there's the, um, the approach of predictive. So how can you start really seeing when someone comes in the door after one or two transactions, what will their future customer lifetime value be? And once you get to that stage, and we'll talk about that in the latter half, that's when you can really start to deploy these, uh, these basically tools tactically. So these are the kinds of use cases that you can do once you really have a handle on CLV. So the first is obviously you can bring in a higher value of audience. You can really start hyper-targeting. Uh, we'll unpack that a little bit later. You can start building your segments actually powered by this. You know, we've all heard of personas. We've all probably started using uh, segmenting in our email campaigns, but it's a completely different lensing effect and targeting effect when you start segmenting from the ground up with true CLV. Uh, you can also start looking at more conversions. You can start looking at features. So for instance, you can start identifying early on what are these early signals that uh, denote a customer that's coming in might be downstream a much higher value customer. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the use case. And then finally, you're going to make better strategic decisions, uh, which again, Professor McCarthy will talk about. And so with that being said, I'm actually going to pass it to Professor McCarthy. He will take you through a couple case studies. All right, great. Let me get the screen up and running. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Yeah, as Michael had said, one of the big things that we can do with CLV is make better decisions and really take everything up a level above the tactical and use this to actually you know, think about how it can make your business more valuable. And you know, to the extent that you're going to be uh, raising funding rounds, you know, in the coming years, uh, I think CLV, as as I'm going to show it, uh, can be a very crucial element to uh, getting you a higher valuation in those funding rounds. So, to the extent that valuation is important to you, uh, this is extremely relevant, if not the most relevant thing that you can be focusing on. And the way that it does so is through customer-based corporate valuation. And it's this methodology that I co-invented with Professor Peter Fader from the Wharton School uh, that explicitly links CLV and kind of the, more broadly speaking, the, the main drivers of the unit economic health of customers to the overall valuation of the firm in a very explicit way. And it's going to do it by specifically driving that valuation model off of five primary drivers of uh, customer-based value. It's the number of people you can bring in the door. As Michael was saying, the CAC, you know, the amount that you spent to, to acquire them in the first place, how long those customers remain with you before they churn, how many orders they place while they're alive, the amount that they spend on those orders, and then how that spend con uh, translates into marginal profitability. And if you combine that up with just very standard uh, valuation models, whether it be a multiples method, or a standard discounted cash flow valuation model, this mathematically has to give you the value of your firm. So this, is, this was the essence of my dissertation. I've built out 
uh, kind of methodologies to be able to bring this to life for private companies, for public companies, for subscription-based businesses, for non-subscription businesses. So in the case studies that I'm going to present next, I'll be focusing on a couple of subscription cases, but I very much encourage you to both read uh, the paper that I've put out that lays out the corresponding methodology for non-subscription businesses. And please speak with me. We've, we've run these analyses for many private equity firms and late stage venture capital firms, which should hopefully not only be an indication of their interest in uh, these metrics, but also uh, the fact that you know, we can definitely be just as accurate for non-subscription businesses as we can for subscription ones. So I figured I'd start by just providing a, a high-level overview of how customer-based corporate valuation works. So imagine we're thinking about, about your firm, and we're just looking out over the next three quarters. The first thing that you need to do is basically model and forecast the total size of your customer base. Obviously, if it's the first quarter of, of commercial operations for your business, you're going to acquire some number of customers, and that's how many you have. When we roll forward to the second quarter, there's going to be some customers that remain with you from the first quarter, and then you're going to acquire some more customers in the second quarter. And that's going to give you how many customers that you had at the end of the second quarter. And we can kind of keep rinsing and repeating that exercise over all future periods, and that mathematically has to give us the number of customers that are with your firm into the indefinite future. So again, this is only driven off of acquisition and retention. Then if you gave me the, the order rate and the basket size for customers at the firm, that has to give me sales. And then if you gave me the contribution margin, the amount that I spent to acquire customers, uh, the fixed costs and other cash flow related uh, line items on the balance sheet, that has to get me to free cash flows. You discount that back at the weighted average cost of capital, sum it up, and that gets you the value of the operating assets of your firm. And then once you adjust for non-operating assets uh, and the number of shares that you happen to have outstanding, that gives you the stock price. So again, there's nothing controversial about this model. It is essentially a DCF model, but all it's doing is decomposing certain elements of that model uh, to break them out and drive them off of uh, the activity of your customers. And so the real key here, it makes a lot of sense, but the real key is that we need to be able to model and forecast customer acquisition, retention, and the monetization of customers while they're with you to be able to, to get a reliable valuation. So the, the models that I use, again, are, are kind of standard models uh, in the statistical world. Uh, they've primarily been used by actuaries to predict the mortality of, of people, as in physical mortality. Here, obviously, it's not physical mortality usually, uh, but actually the mortality of people with your firm. How long are they going to be with you before they kind of terminate the relationships? So again, powering that whole model that I just described, that is what gives you CLV. But as we can see, if we just kind of string out the, the actual cash flows period by period, it also gives you the value of your firm, which should be, uh, again, that's an amazing use case for these exact same models. And I think one of the big benefits of this methodology, in addition to just being more accurate in general, is that it's going to bring the whole organization, all of its stakeholders, in sync with each other. Obviously, the CEO and the CEO, uh, the CEO and the CFO, they care about who gets what mailers, but not really. They're kind of one level up from that. What they really care about is the value of the stock price. And so here we are, you know, with that more accurate valuation model. Of course, they're on board. The CMO should love this because essentially the CMO is the one who owns the customer relationships in the first place. And so this, in some sense, is like a Trojan horse, which is saying what the CMO is doing is a lot more valuable than maybe it was previously uh, given credit for. And then finally, there's the investors. You know, these are the private equity firms, the, the, the VC firms that uh, you might be doing your funding rounds with. Obviously, they want to make good investments. And to the extent that this can help them identify true underlying value, this is extremely important to them, whether it's a late stage or an early stage company. So you know, even holding aside the predictive accuracy and diagnostic benefits of the model, I think just the fact that we're now creating a common language that everyone can speak, that has value in and of itself. So again, the North Star, the main question, the ultimate question, 
to me is not net promoter score. The main question is, what effect is any change that I'm going to propose for the 2019 budget or the 2019 uh, kind of calendar year, what is that going to, to do to my CBCV? What is that going to do to the value of my firm from a customer-based perspective? That is the main question that I, I ask whenever I see any, uh, any proposal. So I want to bring it to life. I don't want it to be all theoretical. <laughs> so the first example that I'm going to go through is Blue Apron. So I figured I'd kind of set the stage. So it's June the 2nd, 2017. I had defended my dissertation. I just put together this methodology for customer-based corporate valuation. I was feeling pretty good about kind of where things were. I said, you know, why not waste some time uh, kind of using this method on, on real companies? So it just so happened that that was the day that Blue Apron had filed their Form S1, which was basically uh, the statement that all companies that intend to IPO uh, put out before they do so. And a former student of my advisor uh, had basically asked my advisor uh, what he thought of it. And in turn, uh, my advisor had asked me. So I figured I had some time to burn. Let's dive in. So first, there was a story that Blue Apron was putting out in their filing. Basically, they were the market leader. They had 53% market share, which means more dollars were spent on meal kits through them than everyone else in the industry combined. The industry itself was booming. Uh, it had grown tremendously over the past couple of years. And Blue Apron's revenue as well was going up in turn. So they had over more than doubled the revenue over the previous year. They had more than 10 x the revenue over the, the two years prior. So essentially, the story that they were telling was, here's an industry that all the industry experts are saying will continue to grow at a very, very rapid rate in the coming years as it takes share away from grocery stores and restaurants. And as long as Blue Apron can maintain uh, the sort of industry-leading position that it has, it's going to be a very valuable company. And so even though it's losing money, it's going to grow its way out of that issue. What was interesting was they had not put any mention, there were no disclosures in the filing at all about their customer retention. And so one of the, the things that I did was construct a model very similar to the one that I described previously uh, for customer acquisition, customer retention, order rate, basket size, et cetera, and then just take all the points, the data points that they did disclose and use that to back my way into what the company's retention curve was. And this is what it showed. So what we're looking at on the right over here is Blue Apron's retention curve. Basically, they acquire a cohort of customers and what percent of those customers are still with the firm in future months. So basically, one of the key data points that I highlighted in an analysis that I did of them was that if you just kind of look at month number six, so that's saying six months out, only 28% of customers that they'd acquired were still with them. So they were burning through about 70% of all their customer acquisitions by six months later. That's really, that's really tough. And the other tough thing was that their customer acquisition cost was going through the roof. So we can see here is just kind of month by month what I had inferred their CAC to be. And what we can see is you know, between 2014 and 2016, their CAC generally hovered between, call it, $50 and $80. But in the period in the run-up to the IPO, their CAC had really started to skyrocket. So it went from 50 to 80, up to 100, up to 120, 150 even. And the trickiest part about that was I had inferred using that same model that after a customer is acquired, the net present value of all the future variable profit they're going to bring in is about $133. So at a $50 CAC, you know, we're still talking almost a three times CLV to CAC, but at a $150 CAC, they're actually losing money. Or as Michael had said, you know, they're kind of upside down. And that's really, really challenging. I think what they were trying to do was goose their revenue numbers to make the revenue look very strong going into the IPO. And it just so happened that in the quarter prior to their IPO, uh, they first ticked above a million active customers. I think they, they had certain numbers in mind that they wanted to meet, put in their filings. But I think they were essentially 
pretty much burning money uh, to be able to hit those numbers. So I kind of put this analysis together and I, again, this wasn't part of any academic paper. This was really just an illustration of the method that I had described in a previous journal of marketing paper. And I just posted it on LinkedIn and there's nothing, I, I really wasn't expecting much out of it, but uh, it was really kind of the first piece to scientifically break down uh, both the company's retention curve and their customer acquisition cost in this way. And it ended up going viral. So there were mentions all over the Wall Street Journal multiple times, Fortune, Forbes, uh, you know, pretty much all the major financial news outlets, as well as uh, many of the, the non-financial news outlets as well, like the New York Times. And it was even acknowledged by people within Blue Apron themselves. So this was a quote from Jared Clough, you know, basically saying that uh, you know, people within the firm uh, follow my work closely. Unfortunately, uh, he was the chief marketing officer until about uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, just recently, uh, he was he kind of fell victim to uh, the restructuring that they've been in the middle of. Uh, those who've been following their uh, their numbers recently, their performance has uh, continued to uh, to be you know relatively poor, and so they've been trying to right size their business by uh, by downsizing. Obviously. Uh, Many of the people on the line are probably familiar with what's happened to their stock price. So they had uh, originally targeted an IPO uh, price range of $15 to $17 a share, uh, which was upwards of a $3 billion valuation. They ended up having to cut their uh, IPO price target uh, down to 10. That's what they IPO'd at. And uh, last I checked, their stock was down a further about 90%. So obviously, yeah, ten dollar price is much less than uh, fifteen to seventeen. But you know, for those who are able to get borrow uh, and identify that you know, this company had some structural issues, uh, they still would have uh, been able to generate a, a massive profit on the short side. So I've continued to follow the company very closely. Uh, I've got another uh, LinkedIn post. We'll be uh, sharing contact information at the end of this presentation uh, that kind of brings us fully up to speed up to the third quarter of 2018. So you know, those who are interested, I'd love to get uh, get your thoughts about that. I've, I've got a piece in the Harvard Business Review about them and about uh, subscription businesses in general. And I've got a, a Harvard Business uh, case study as well. So I've written a lot about this company and, and thought a lot about them. And it was really kind of that story that kicked off the next case study. So I'd written that case study, you know, kind of a cautionary conclusion. And just a few months after that, uh, the CEO of emails had reached out and basically said, you know, let's talk. <laughs> I've got some measures and I'd love to see what you think about my business. So I did, and it was uh, it was a very interesting story. So first, I just want to give a little background for those who are not familiar with emails. Uh, they're a privately held company. Uh, they are smaller, so that I think it's something on the order of nine million in revenues. So you know, for those who are are on the smaller side, again, I think you know, these sort of concepts can be just as relevant to you. Uh, they're a digital meal planning subscription, so they are a meal delivery company. But the way that they do it is not by having food shipped to distribution centers, having laborers cut and pre-portion everything, put it all in insulating material, and then ship those boxes uh, to people's homes. What they instead do is they operate something of an app. So they have a copyrighted, protected, uh, very, very large store of recipes. And they've got a lot of relationships with some of the firms that I've shown down at the bottom here, where essentially, basically, to the extent that you are interested in, in certain meals, with the click of a button, uh, you can have those meals kind of, uh, kind of put together at the supermarket and either uh, brought to you via someone like an Instacart, or you could pick it up at the grocery store, kind of like an Amazon locker sort of a thing. Uh, but in general, they essentially intermediate uh, your transaction directly with the supermarket. And so as a result, uh, they can have, uh, they've got a much, more asset light business. It makes them much more scalable. You know, essentially, they are software. And for you as a consumer, you only spend about half as much on a meal kit because you don't have to pay for all the, the supply chain that a traditional meal kit company would have. 
One of the other upshot, upshots from a customer-based corporate valuation standpoint is it means their margins are a lot higher. So whereas a Blue Apron has a contribution margin maybe in the high 20%, uh, and emails has a contribution of more like 90% or maybe even higher. So hopefully everyone's up to speed about their business. So essentially, the main thing I care about is CBCV. That's my hammer. <laughs> so I figure what better way to kind of illustrate uh, and diagnose the health of this company than to look at some of the very same measures that we were looking at with Blue Apron. So first is customer acquisition. Uh, their customer acquisition growth is very strong. Uh, just over the past year, uh, their customer acquisitions are up over 60% year on year. But again, the big message that I've been uh, painting so far is you really need to go beneath the surface of these numbers to ascertain the health of the business. So next is retention. So what we're looking at in this chart is kind of cohort by cohort what percent of customers are being retained by the firm over time. So again, this is very similar to the retention curve that I'd shown for Blue Apron, but instead, because uh, they were, because emails was able to give me uh, the cohort by cohort information, I could provide uh, curves for each of the cohorts that they've acquired over time. And we can see much stronger customer retention. In general, just to kind of take one point in particular, one year out, so this is kind of one year after customers have been acquired, on the order of 43% of customers are still with the firm. And that is far higher than the about 23% that I had inferred for Blue Apron. Moreover, across the various cohorts, our retention is very stable. So essentially what we're looking at in this chart is it's the previous chart, but it's kind of backing all the lines to the left and it's saying, Let's look at all these various cohorts, one month, two months, three months after acquisition, what percent of the customers are still with the firm? And the trend that we can see here is that there is no trend. <laughs> Essentially, all these cohorts are behaving like clockwork. And if this company were to acquire a new cohort in Q3 or Q4 of 2018, my best guess would be that we continue along the same sort of trajectory. So for this company, the retention modeling is very, very easy. One of the troubling things with Blue Apron, if we were to look to credit card panel data, is that their retention has been deteriorating for more recent cohorts. Next, we turn to the amount that they're spending to bring customers in the door. So again, at Blue Apron, we saw that it was skyrocketing in recent periods, but before it was 50 to 80. Well, for emails, it's 50 to 60. This is the CAC quarter by quarter. Again, this is observed. There is no ambiguity about these figures. So in general, their CAC is much lower than Blue Aprons. And the amount of value that emails acquires per acquired customer after they've been brought in the door is also actually higher than at Blue Apron. So even though they make less revenue per month uh, for a given customer that's with the firm, because their margin is so strong and the customer lifetimes are so long that uh, the value is, is higher. So again, the, the amount that they spend to bring them in the door is lower and the amount that they get afterwards is higher. That's what I call uh, much better unit economics. So if we just kind of put the numbers head to head in a simple summary, the one year retention rate is much higher at emails and it's stable. The expected lifetime of a customer is about double that of Blue Aprons. The amount of value that emails is getting after customers have been acquired is higher the amount that they're spending is less than half. And as a result, the customer lifetime value at emails is dramatically higher, translating to about 152% CLV to CAC, where again, CLV, I just wanna make perfectly clear, is the post acquisition value of a customer and then subtracting off the CAC. So by, traditional, by the traditional way of describing that measure, uh, this would be two and a half times. You know, versus 1% or even negative at Blue Apron. So if there's some key lessons that I wanted to, to really take home uh, today, you know, the first is, this is the future. Again, uh, through my new venture, I am very regularly perform helping diligences uh, be performed by private equity firms and venture capital firms. So clearly, there are more and more firms now that are paying a lot more attention to CLV.
And the results may be surprising. So we've seen many companies that are very unprofitable right now, but we infer them to be great businesses because the variable profitability of the customers that they're bringing in is wonderful. And I just wanted to make that point very clear. CLV does, a focus on CLV and CBCV does not mean that companies need to be profitable from the very beginning. If companies have invested a lot of money to have a very nice scalable, uh, you know, kind of fixed cost structure, that's great. That's completely fine. And you know, this sort of methodology can infer that sort of business will have a very high valuation. All that this methodology is saying is that the variable profitability of customers uh, needs to be strong. It's easier than ever before to perform an exercise like the ones that I've described uh, so far. So again, these examples that I used, they were subscription examples, but actually my bread and butter, the main sort of analyses that I've been doing for Theta and that I had done for hundreds of companies through Zodiac before it was acquired by Nike were for non-subscription firms like yours. And it's getting easier and easier, not only to perform this sort of an exercise for yourself, but also to then start to ask the question of how my numbers benchmark off of those of my competitors. And that's, it's, it's getting easier than ever before because of uh, data that's been made available uh, through companies like Second Measure. Oh, let me just make sure somehow the uh, screen kind of stopped for me. Well, I think, I think, uh, let's see if we can get that back really quickly. Um, yeah, I'm pretty much wrapped up. I'd say kind of the main, <laughs> okay. yeah, the main additional point I wanted to make is all I right. think, yeah, growth at all costs is not the future. Uh, we're moving away from that. We're moving into a world where uh, sound unit economics and sales durability are what matter the most. Great. Uh, well, thank you for that. And uh, Alex, if we could change up the presentation, I think, you know, one of the great takeaways from uh, Professor McCarthy here is that uh, if, if what he is doing, and it's absolutely right, is, um, is, is, is almost diagnostic, then what we need to do is think about, well, what's the medicine? And really, when you're thinking about this, you obviously want to know the health of your business, but then you want to figure out, okay, well, how do I make changes accordingly? And I almost think back to Blue Apron as an interesting example. With my last company, which was acquired by uh, Summit Partners, a large private equity firm, um, you know, we followed Blue Apron pretty closely. And uh, there were probably warning signs along the way where they could have made uh, tactical decisions, and I do not want to uh, Monday morning quarterback that particular company, but with me, the companies that Retina works with, it really is this kind of one-two punch to what Professor McCarthy does, and, and we've been actually lucky enough to work with Professor McCarthy in building out some of our methodologies and building on some of his work. Um, so specifically, let's talk about the difference now between looking at your business in a historical perspective and really on a go-forward perspective, how do I start acquiring a better kind of customer and what are some of the techniques I can do on day one to improve that customer journey and increase uh, the value of said customer? So the first thing is obviously targeting CAC. So that all-important CAC to LTV ratio that um, Professor McCarthy was alluding to where it was obviously almost negative with Blue Apron and it was in a healthy 2.5 to 3x uh, with emails. So how do we reduce the CAC? Well, one of the ways you're going to do this is through new tooling that I'll bring up, uh, some of which is not publicly available. The second thing you can start doing is SEO and SEM optimization and other channel optimization by tracking the LTV or CLV of different customers through each channel. And then you can actually start looking at what elements make up your best customers. So when we get into some case studies quickly, I'll show you how we would do that. Um, so let's, let's first just really quickly talk about how it would work if you're now trying to predict what a customer will do. So obviously historic CLV is something we've been thinking about, but as Professor McCarthy talked about, being able to predict when someone will churn, being able to predict what their downstream buying behavior will be, allows you to know much earlier in the customer journey what that uh, future uh, customer lifetime value will be. And when you start being able to do this, you can start, in a sense, you can start interceding earlier uh, from a retention standpoint. So if we look at this customer journey pathway, 
you know, each customer here, each dot represents a transaction, and each transaction amount is actually going to be held constant here. Obviously, in the real world, cart sizes change, but one of the things that's pretty self-evident here is the first customer at the top hasn't purchased in a long time, and the second customer is purchasing on a regular piece. So we can probably predict that the second one's alive, the first one might have already lapsed. But it gets a little more interesting when you have a lot more data to work with. And so you can start predicting how much they might spend, when they might churn, and some of the extra elements that identify them when they're coming in through your funnel. So if we look at the data that we're actually leveraging at Retina uh, to really try to push this field forward, the first is their historical spending behavior. And I always get the question from emerging brands, you know, how much data do I need to collect? And also, uh, you know, how long do I have to collect it for? Well, from a, a standpoint, we like to see at least a year to a year and a half of historical data. That allows you to model for, you know, seasonality and things uh, like that. But that doesn't mean if you're a six-month-old customer uh, or, or company that you can't start doing this yourself or you can't start at least tracking this at a cohort level. The uh, second element, which I think is more exciting, especially for CMOs, is when you start blending this with third-party data, with interaction or clickstream data. So you can imagine now you see a customer come in and based on certain items they're buying or what operating system they're using even, you can start to think, oh, this is a signal potentially that we're starting to notice for higher LTV customers. Well, once you have all of these, and again, this is sort of what Retina does, and we believe we do this uh, at a level that's the best in the world, you can then start leveraging it in tools. And one of my favorite new tools that's come out, and we have a, a, a special relationship with Facebook actually around this particular tool, is the value-based lookalike audience tool. So everyone probably at this point is familiar with building lookalike audiences, especially if you're acquiring through Facebook. But one of the new things Facebook realized in an effort to combat that higher cost of acquisition is if they could, on their end, find more of the customers that look like your high LTV customers, then they in turn should both theoretically drive down the cost of acquisition by suppressing ads to those who don't have those high LTVs, and also it should bring in a better quality of customer, because if this person on their end looks like your higher LTV customer, more likely they should behave accordingly. So we actually put this to the test with three different businesses, and I'll take you through sort of the results here, but if you want to set this up yourself, the first thing you need to do is make sure you have an extremely accurate LTV score, because this can go wonky very quickly. If you mislabel them, then Facebook's obviously, obviously going to match to a mislabeled customer. So the first uh, case study I'd like to present is around Distilled. Uh, it's a fashion brand based in LA. They originally specialized in denim. They have many other uh, uh, items now that they sell and they're growing rapidly. But just like every other business, they were experiencing the pain of rising cost of acquisition. So what we told them to do, and this is what we invite everyone to do, is to run a sort of A-B test. And in this split test, you're going to take whatever your current best performing creative is, and you're going to use whatever targeting mechanism that you might be employing at the current moment for building a lookalike audience. Um, in this case, what I always see is something like your best performing customers over the last 90 days, you'll do some sort of lookalike audience on that. Now you can see why this could be problematic because past does not always prologue with customers. So what they look like or how they were performing over the last 90 days, that might not map to your best customers going forward. So we go in and we actually will do this for free for businesses, uh, this particular test. We go in and label a subsample of their customers, and we actually do an LTV lookalike look -alike campaign. And we run this for two to four weeks. So maybe you can deploy five to $10,000 of budget, you run this split test, and the results have been pretty shocking, actually. So the first thing you'll notice is that conversions go up, but more importantly, the cost of acquisition dropped dramatically for this business. Um, in fact, well, I don't think we'll see numbers like this with most businesses, but this is sort of a game-changing drop in the cost of acquisition. But more importantly, we then track how those customers perform over time. So not just in the first transaction, but later on in their life cycle, because obviously they are, the LTV is not always equal to just one transaction, especially in a high-frequency business. And we found that the percentage of high LTV conversions skyrocketed. So not only 
did we correct that ratio by dropping the CAC precipitously, but we also were seeing a higher level of LTV conversion. The next, uh, the next item that is worth uh, looking at is Ritual. So Ritual is a business many might be familiar with that's a subscription business, and they actually do vitamins for women. And so the first business distilled, again, that's not subscription, and as Dan McCarthy mentioned, you can really do this for subscription or non-subscription businesses. But in this case, they sell only two types of uh, vitamins, and it's a monthly purchase. So for them, getting the right customer is critical because they're going to be spending more than that first purchase. They need to know they're bringing a customer in that's actually going to stay with them for many months. Otherwise, they're not going to be right side up on these economics. And we found, again, that by doing this, you were able to drop the cost of acquisition by a meaningful amount, especially when you consider many of these businesses are spending large sums of money on these acquisition channels. And we're actually monitoring right now, uh, it's an in-process uh, pilot, how they'll perform. So we've predicted they will uh, actually not churn out as quickly as these other customers that have been acquired. And when that com is completed, we would add this to the case study. One of my favorite case studies, though, is a leading beauty brand that we've been working with. And for me, what's exciting about this is you can also see even if the cost of acquisition doesn't always drop by a large amount, the quality of customer being brought in increases dramatically. So for this business, they had pretty good data. And keep in mind, to do this, really we just need at the customer ID level, transaction history data. But in this case, they also have data around, you know, if the person coming in, what sort of attributes they had. Uh, we were able to also look at clickstream data and identify very quickly what a customer looks like right off the bat that might be signaling for high lifetime value. Uh, we kind of call this intrinsic lifetime value. And then obviously once it becomes predicted and resolved, you can think of it as the true CLV of the customer. And we found that their quality of customer coming in, the high LTV conversions skyrocketed. So again, for this business, uh, using this tooling, sometimes you don't see it fully on the cost of acquisition side, but the quality of customer that's being brought in is much better. And we've been speaking with uh, platforms like Snap, and we'll be speaking with other ones, uh, like for instance, if you're using Google or through YouTube or other platforms there, they all are building out this targeting technology, but there is ways to do this even if they don't have a value-based lookalike audience uh, tool. So we can talk about that later in the Q&A section. More importantly though, if again, and I love how Professor McCarthy talked about this being a hammer, if you're starting to use it in this way, now you can get very surgical. So another thing that we do for businesses, if they have uh, the proper data, is map where the high lifetime value customers are coming in from by a channel standpoint. So in the case of this sort of node graph off to the side, you know, we can see here that in certain cases, Facebook might be a low LTV channel for this business, but Bing and Google were actually high LTV channels. However, they weren't spending accordingly. So this is a way to start thinking about rebalancing your channel budgets or starting to think about really where are these high value customers coming in from and are there ways I need to rethink my strategy on how I'm targeting them. So again, you can use sort of customer lifetime value as a filter or a way to rethink a lot of these decisions strategically and tactically across the organization. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions, but going back to that original slide that we mentioned earlier, you can do this around products and product mixture. Uh, this can also actually be used to try to predict what are these sort of personas around high CLV customers. So this can be used in multiple ways and uh, I'd invite you to reach out and we can talk deeply about the different tactical ways that this can be used once your business really has a firm grasp on what the CLV is at the customer level for your business. So with that being said, I'd love to open this up for questions. Um, I think we have a good amount of time, Alex, for that. So uh, that would be great. Great, well, thank you both very much for that. That was incredibly helpful, interesting. I've heard it before, but continue to learn more each time I talk to you both. So um, with that, we've had a number of questions come in ahead of time. So we'll go through some of those and then a few questions throughout the presentation as well. But if anyone else has anything pop up in the meantime, feel free to continue to submit um, anything you'd like us to cover. Okay. 
So we'll jump in. Okay, one question that came in ahead of time. What is the best way to calculate for a food CPG direct to consumer site that launched just three months ago and doesn't have a lot of data to work off of? Okay, I, I'll tell you what, I'll uh, take a quick crack at it and then I can pass to Professor McCarthy if uh, he has any thoughts. So again, in this case, you may not be able to use a machine learning technique that, for instance, we might be using at Retina, but one thing you can do is use some basic formulas and calculate this at the cohort level. And I think that's really important. So there are some things that we can actually share links to in terms of easy ways to calculate customer lifetime value. And I would recommend, as part of your KPIs for your business, just calculating it at least at the cohort level. Once you get to about a year to a year and a half of data, and you're capturing it at the customer, again, ID level, so you have transaction histories linked to the customer, then you can start using advanced machine learning techniques, uh, which should absolutely be on your radar. Yeah, and just to, to build on that, yeah, I think of once you've got that kind of year to year and a half, uh, the key is that you have some customers that have lived that long. At that point, you can have many more customers who were acquired more recently. You might have you know, only one month of data for them, uh, but you can kind of connect the dots, you know, on, on the back end to, to be able to, to take some of those older cohorts and use the information from those to be able to uh, to infer pretty well uh, what the value of those younger cohorts are. But yeah, kind of as, as Michael had mentioned, I can't stress enough, if there is annual seasonality, for example, and you don't have a year's worth of data, how the heck do you infer what, uh, you know, what those seasonal fluctuations are going to be? The one thing I would say as well is um, I'd mentioned second measure on on kind of the final slide in, in my part of the uh, the talk. They're a uh, a business intelligence firm, so they have a, a very large credit card panel. And what a data set like that could allow you to do is, even though you don't have a whole lot of data about your specific firm, if you had other firms that you thought were similar to yours, you could essentially go into that data set and say, well, you know, I don't know what's happened to me, but I can say, you know, this is what happened to uh, to kind of uh, peer firms. So you know, that could be another way to get some insight until you, know, you do kind of get to that one, one year and a half point. Great. Um, similarly, another question that came in ahead of time, and then there have been a number um, that have just come in on this topic is um, what sort of tools are out there? And so one that was um, specifically asked about was HubSpot. Um, and how that is as a, as a tool to, to measure um, lifetime customer value. So starting with HubSpot and then maybe getting into some others that you might recommend. Yeah, HubSpot, they, they put out a uh, kind of a note about calculating LTV. And I've seen similar notes be put out by other firms like Kissmetrics. You know, they have a very popular LTV note. I'm sure many of you have probably read it. Uh, the big issue with those analyses is that they're really not trying to get an accurate lifetime value. They're trying to, to kind of get that proof of concept into your head, which is kind of similar to what uh, Michael had shown at the beginning of his, uh, his talk. Uh, but essentially, that formula will, will lead you astray. You're going to get a very, very poor, inaccurate estimate of, of CLV. So I can't stress enough, uh, you can have CLV estimates that are off by a factor of four or five, and you can get the rank order wrong. Uh, so you really owe it to yourself to use the right formula. And yeah, again, I, I think that's a point that's especially worth raising because, yeah, Michael, I'm sure you had gotten this a lot as well. Um, I got it a lot at Zodiac. There'll be many people who say, yeah, you know, we do that CLV stuff already. You know, we do what hub, we just follow the HubSpot, you know, or you know, whatever. And uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, you know, it's like you, you bought into the philosophy, but you know, uh, th there's definitely room for improvement on the model. Absolutely, and and again, you know, the effects can be pretty deleterious because you know it's one thing if it's just a KPI that you're really not paying attention to and it doesn't go into your board report. It's completely different if you're starting to leverage it for building a lookalike audience or doing anything tactically. Uh, it can actually do the exact opposite. It can be poison and really hurt you and hurt your acquisition costs and uh, your retention and retargeting techniques. Because again, like you said, you've mislabeled someone, therefore you're targeting them incorrectly. Yep. Okay. So the next question um, about blended customer lifetime value. So when you're acquiring customers through multiple channels, 
how do you go about calculating the blended um, customer lifetime value? Yeah, it's a great question. When you're acquiring customers through different channels, uh, there's obviously kind of two main things that can be different. You could be spending different amounts of money to bring them in the door, and the value of those customers after they've been acquired can be different because you know, some can have more goodness than others. And you really want to allow for the possibility that, again, some customers are better, some customers are worse. You know, in general, not all customers are created equal. So uh, I think you know, the great thing is uh, models like uh, the ones that I use in my academic research and that Michael uses at, at Retina, uh, they're very, very flexible in allowing for some customers to be really good and some customers to be you know, really not quite so good. <laughs> and uh, you know, the great thing is, as long as I've had the opportunity to observe customers for some period of time, then I can kind of come up with that accurate CLV estimate and then say, well, you know, I know what channel they came in through. Let me then just kind of get the average CLV by acquisition channel and then subtract off the channel specific CAC to get an LTV that's specific to the channel. So, uh, you know, so hopefully you know, that was kind of my thought. Yeah, and the only thing I would add is that graph that I showed at the very end on SEO, SEM optimization and channel optimization. So we do this actually uh, for business businesses and we inject, like you said, whatever the CAC is per channel. So you can actually see it's an, all, it's an amazing tool for businesses. It's usually a moment when the you know, CMO blinks a few times because you can see the areas and channels that you're uh, losing money on from a lifetime value standpoint and the ones where you're making money. And you can kind of see those areas where you're bleeding, in a sense, or areas where you're growing. Uh, so when you're thinking about rebalancing channels, you get more than just your blended CAC. You can actually go in and see where am I right side up or not. And this is an analysis that we do out of box, but again, can be done uh, with the right team as well internally. It actually reminded me of one more important thing on this point. Uh, one thing that we'll do with Theta is we'll very frequently get these sort of numbers, uh, but we'll get them year by year. So, you know, your best channels today may be very different from your best channels two years ago. And so instead of just taking a static snapshot that just treats all of your historical data as being kind of one in the same, divide it up by year. And you'll see very clear trends oftentimes in, uh, in the goodness of some channels versus others. Absolutely. Great. The next question, over what time period should you calculate lifetime? And how do you know if it's, you've waited too long and maybe you've lost a customer? Um, and, and similarly, how, another question came in, um, how do you calculate churn? How do you know that a customer is actually gone for good? Great question. And I think this partially goes back to the HubSpot article you know, that they say, yeah, to calculate lifetime value, one of the things you need to know is the lifetime of customers. And so just get the average lifetime of customers. And for those of you who run non-subscription businesses, you're probably scratching your head and thinking, how do I even know when a customer has churned? All I, all I know is when they made purchases, but it's not like they sign a contract with me that they can cancel. So, uh, so it is a great question. And I think that's exactly where the sort of models that, uh, that we've been using really shine. We basically embrace the fact that we don't know when customers churn. So we treat that as what's called you know, latent or unobserved. So it's a, a latent attrition model. And at any point in time, customers could be alive or they could be, they could be churned. And we're going to get a probability that they're alive, but we'll never know for sure unless they just made a purchase, then we know that they're alive. So, yeah, so essentially uh, not a whole lot of time needs to elapse uh, for us to be able to say, you know, this person has a high probability of having churned. The other nice thing about uh, having it be a probability is that to your point about win back, uh, we can essentially say, this is a customer who used to be definitely alive and we've seen a big drop in the probability that they're alive so maybe we want to go in and actually take action against that person because we have seen a big drop. And that's the sort of thing that you can do at a tactical level to, uh, you know, to kind of keep the value of those customers up. Absolutely. And, and I'll, I'll also add one quick caveat. Sometimes people use recency of last purchase alone as their kind of metric, and that can be pretty dangerous, um, again, because of seasonality, because of other effects. And so as Professor McCarthy alluded to, Having a little bit of historical data does allow you to put a probabilistic score on each one of these customers. And so just trying to use, and it's fine if you're a young business, especially to use competitive comps 
or industry comps, but it's really dangerous sometimes to just use recency alone. Someone hasn't purchased in X amount of time as the only way you're segmenting for whether they're alive or dead. Um, you know, my background was in physics and we always, I always think of Schrodinger's cat, right? In the box, it's both alive and dead. That's a way to think about these customers, right? At a probabilistic way. We're not saying they've definitively churned, but when they hit below a certain threshold, you can kind of then arrange a different segmentation bucket that they would fall into. Great, so we probably have time for just one more question. Unfortunately, we've had so many come in, but we'll be sure to follow up with everyone who submitted a question. Um, but, and this is one that I think is important because a lot of the entrepreneurs on, on the webinar today are not direct to consumer um, or not primarily direct to consumer brands. And so how do you go about measuring lifetime customer value when you're an omni-channel business? It's a great question. Uh, so, I would say, so with Omnichannel, we do look at multiple levels, and it gets a little bit more difficult, obviously, in terms of the way you would predict this. But once a customer transacts with you, regardless of what channel they come in on, and you are capturing that transaction data, you can then back into what this projected lifetime value will be. And if you observe them long enough, you'll obviously have a realized lifetime value. So then you can map it back to the channels and start seeing, uh, you know, what are what what their lifetime value is by these different channels, and you can adjust your spend accordingly. There are businesses like Market Share, which charge, um, you know, decent. It's, it's, it's relatively expensive service that can help you with sort of optimizing spend from an omni-channel perspective. Uh, but with that being said, we see all the time that a person might touch three different channels before converting, and so how you weight that score back to the channel uh, is, is, you know, you can hire businesses to do this or you can come up with your own internal weighting. But the good news is, if you are capturing your data correctly, and I can't stress this enough for young businesses, you can find the LTV and back into what, you know, the primary channel was through the acquisition. Uh, Professor McCarthy, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, through Zodiac, I'd work with a number of omni-channel businesses uh, directly. So you definitely can kind of speak from personal experience on that. Uh, there's many that will have sales coming in through stores, through online, you know, through other uh, through other channels. And again, the key is that we have the ability to track those purchases and tie them back to, to the same customer IDs. It's not necessarily as easy as it would be if you only sold through a website, but it's absolutely critical if you want to get you know, a proper estimate of CLV. So the big area, basically I would say, typically as long as your capture rate on uh, in-store transactions is, you know, call it 70% or higher, um, I'd say that's acceptable enough to have confidence that uh, your estimates of CLV will be uh, reasonably close to, to what they actually are. Uh, but again, Kind of the, the big thing I'd emphasize is it really pays then to invest to make sure that you're capturing all those transactions where you can. And uh, sometimes it might not be possible, uh, but there are a lot more ways uh, than, than you might originally believe to be able to kind of get that full 360 view of the customer. And you really need that to come up with any realistic estimate of CLV. If you can't see what the customers are doing over time, you know, we have nothing to go off of. That's right. And, and I think, you know, in, in closing on that, you know, these are deeper questions sometimes and there are different specific approaches. So I know on behalf of Professor McCarthy and, and myself, we'd be happy to, if you reach out to us, uh, talk to you about any one of those particular areas and also any literature associated with it, we'd be happy to share as well. And on that note too, yeah, connect with us. Yeah, LinkedIn, Twitter. Please. I'd love to, yeah. to have that conversation going. I share a lot of content about CBCV and CLV in general, uh, you know, especially recent events. So um, you know, to the extent that any of this has been interesting, um, I'd love to, to have you as part of my network. Absolutely. Great. Thank well, you, I Alex, can't... by the way, and Circle Up as well. Yeah. Thank you. I can't thank you two enough. Um, this has been fabulous. And to everyone who joined today, thank you very much. Um, like I said, I know a ton of questions flooded in towards the end just there. So um, we didn't get to cover everything, but we 
Um, we'll follow up with everyone and while we can also schedule maybe a, a just another Q&A session um, if that's of interest. So everyone, please look out for a link to a survey that I'll send out um, later this afternoon. And we would love to get your feedback for on this particular topic and other topics that we can cover in the future. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you.